thank everybody for coming. Um, as I, I'll talk more about, uh, as we go through, I'll talk more about how we're gonna do this, what we're gonna try to do, how we're gonna try to accomplish this. Um, but again, I wanna thank you guys. This is what I'm calling a soft launch. So what's gonna happen uh, with this presentation after I am done, is I'll take your feedback, I'll take your inputs, I'll talk to the advisors, I'll talk to the board directors, and we may shift and shape some things a little bit based on the feedback. Um, and then we'll probably use this for our first fundraiser um, somehow in or some shape or form in our first fundraiser uh, where we'll broadcast this to a broader audience and kind of walk through what we're doing, why we're doing it, how people can help. Okay, so the organization is called the Social Innovators for Americans Association. Um, uh, S-I-A-A is the way we pronounce it. Uh, uh, some people will say SIA, some people will say uh, whatever, but it's F-I-A-A is the easiest way to say that repeatedly. So hopefully, uh, hopefully we can get through that. All right, so let's get into it. Change is really slow. So uh, why why are we doing this? Why why do we exist? And let me just kind of tell you how I got into this and what I, what really led me to do this. As I was watching TV and as I was watching some of the things going on in the news, I realized that um, in our country, in our history, there are a lot of problems that happen generation after generation after generation. Um, those problems don't seem to go away, and we don't seem to have any any people really driving or working on solving them. Um, the other thing is that every so often, every, every other or maybe every few generations, we also have problems with um, big events coming up again, like pandemics or, you know, the 50 to 500 year uh, disaster or things of that nature that also happen. The challenge for me and the thing that I watch and observe is that what are we really doing to solve it? We're not really working on getting at the root cause of these solutions. We do a lot of things, we protest, we go out in the streets, we, we write petitions, and those are all good things and helpful things. Um, we, we have nonprofits that are constantly doing, constantly uh, adjusting and, and, and working uh, with the people in the local community, either providing homes, providing food, providing money, providing resources, and we're constantly doing this. And the same people keep coming back um, to this process again. So I said, we need to come up with a better solution uh, and that's kind of what led me to start this organization. And that's how we got started. Um, so what are we gonna talk about today? So what I'm gonna talk about today is I'm going to, one, talk about the challenge. What is the challenge? Why it's a challenge? I wanna talk about the people that we have that are gonna be helping us solve some of these problems. I wanna talk about the process that we're gonna to use to solve the problem. Uh, what is the solution? How can we go about doing this? Uh, we're gonna be using, we're gonna talk about a lot about Five research, collaboration, and implementation management. That is that is the key thing um, that we offer. That is the key service that we offer to communities. And we'll, we're trying to raise money so we can offer that service free to the communities that we support. Um, and then also for you guys, I'm gonna talk to you last and close out with kind of a call to action. So ways you can volunteer, become a member, and or donate. Um, so we'll talk about that. And that's how we'll close out. Okay. So what is the challenge? And, and I think for many of you and everybody who's on this call has heard that there are a lot of challenges going on in our country. Um, and, and even right today, but even before now, we've been facing some of these challenges. Uh, if you look at the, the chart here, we're, we're talking about the, the pandemic and how it's gonna totally impact the level of poverty in our country. Well, we're gonna see 8%. Since 1990, poverty has actually begun to go down but as of 2010, that number has started to shift back up and we're starting to see more poverty uh, across the globe and across the world. Uh, we're also looking at our school systems and the level of proficiency across the uh, schools in the, uh, in the world. And, and you'll notice here that 50% of all of our children and adolescents are not performing at the minimum proficiency levels. So there's some challenges with that. And then we also can look at, uh, even within America, uh, we always think about poor and poor water and poor hygiene uh, practices or, 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 or support systems in foreign countries. But even here in our own home country, we have two million Americans without running water, indoor plumbing, or sanitation. So we, we have some challenges in our country. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to fix them? Um, the interesting thing about all of these problems is, and I'm gonna talk about this chart in a minute, but one of the things that we have to realize is that 
each one of these problems in and of themselves is very complex. Then if you start to look at all of the problems uh, and the very categories of, and the ways people have categorized these problems, it become very interconnected as well. So it's a huge global system that's all linked together. And it's just overwhelming for most of our politicians, for most of our citizens. It's just something that we really, really have to struggle with. So one of the things that I like is that the uh, United Nations came up with these uh, uh, global goals, the, the 17 uh, sustainable goals that they have. And they kind of broken them down into smaller bite-sized chunks. Um, and I'm just gonna go through some of these that I have here where we talk about poverty, uh, we talk about education quality, clean water, uh, uh, reduce inequalities, peace, justice, and institutions. These are just some of them, but there's the total of 17 problems um, that the UN says that we need to resolve around the world. The America, uh, the American uh, Organization of Com uh, Government um, did not sign on to these goals um, in this last administration. Uh, we hope that they will sign on to them going forward. But despite that, despite the government not signing on to them, tons of nonprofits, companies, corporations, a lot of people, schools, public, public school systems have signed up to do something about these problems. And that's exactly what we're trying to do as well. We're trying to address these problems in a more uh, results-oriented approach. That's what we're trying to accomplish. And that's the problem that we're going after. Now, the thing about it is that it seems huge. It seems broad and complex. But there are a couple of things that we're going to try to do to, to bring this down to even smaller bite sizes. One, we're going to try to uh, generate, produce, train, and develop, and deploy as many qualify social innovators as we can out in the community around the world. My goal is to make sure that every community uh, in America that needs a social innovator or social innovator uh, guidance uh, will have access to someone or they will have access to the data to learn it for themselves and to do that. And that's what we will provide as one of our public services to uh, the broader community as well. So who are we? Let's talk a little bit about who we are and what we're trying to do. So, um, as I said, we're Social Innovators uh, of the Poor Americans Association, uh, SIAA. Um, I actually started working on this in February of 2020, just before uh, COVID really got uh, spun up. Um, but we finally got incorporated and all of the paperwork in place as of August uh, of 2020. Um, and we received our 501c this past December. So we are now a fully funded uh, tax exempt nonprofit, uh, charitable nonprofit. Our, our core mission is we wanna provide social innovation services by collaborating with communities to help them solve systemic problems. We wanna resolve these problems one community at a time. That's how we break it down into bite sizes. You can't do it nationally, you can't do it statewide, you can't necessarily do it even within a, a state or city. And sometimes you have to go within communities within that city. And so we have to have enough uh, social innovators and members that are going to be able to go out to those communities when needed, as needed, and provide that service to them. As far as our vision is concerned, what we're trying to do is eliminate systemic social problems that prevent American communities from achieving fair, just, and equitable benefit for all humans. So we are really trying to make sure that our societies and our communities are treated equally across the board um, and across the country. And that's kind of what we're trying to do. So what is social innovation? And, and let me just kind of try to not get too, too academic on you here. So what social innovation is, in the simplest terms, social innovation is primarily using innovation and innovation methods and various types of innovations, product innovations, process innovations, um, and, and, and organization and business innovations to solve social problems. Um, we spend a lot of time and we, there's a lot of hype around all the technical innovation that goes along. But there's a time now, I think that we're really ripe for more social innovation and solving social problems. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, this definition here came, comes from Stanford University Center for Social Innovation. Uh, they're kind of one of the art in our country, in the U.S., they're one of the leaders in this field, um, and they have a lot of strong programs doing this type of work. Um, but a lot of this started with, uh, within the Europe community, so it's a European kind of concept that's come here. 
So how do we do this? What, what are we really doing? So, and I get that question a lot. Well, what do you do? Right? That's all nice and great, but what do you do? So here's kind of what we do. So um, as you can see here, there are about uh, seven steps or seven phases uh, that we have to go through. And what I always tell people, you, we don't start from the beginning and go to the end. It's not serial and it's very modular. The way we approach this is a very modular. We meet the community where they are. So whatever challenges they're having at that point, that's when we decide this is what uh, approach or this is what phase they're in and this is how we're gonna help them. And we have a variety of things uh, to do that. So let me give you an example. So one of our partners um, we've worked with, uh, Michelle Joseph organization, um, she's gonna kill me, but I can't think of the name right now. Um, hi, name Michelle, if you want. Um, but her organization, we started a program with her where we worked with teachers um, and we did a online facilitation session uh, with her uh, organization to help teachers decide how are they going to prepare over the summer, how are they going to prepare to make a learner centric uh, video uh, uh, remote learning uh, system and process for their, for their students. How can they make it more interesting? How can they make it more engaging? They realized that they were having problems with that. So we did that process. Now, if I take what we did with them and we kind of expand it to broader, let's just say to an education or a toy school, and we're gonna work with a school. The first thing we have to do in this process is one, understand what is your vision? Where, where do you wanna go? What do you wanna do? Um, it's what are you trying to accomplish uh, with that? And we'll go through this visioning techniques and process and meetings and strategies and sessions that we'll have with them. Uh, and then we try to figure out, okay, that's what you want to do. So let's contextualize that. What are the what are the factors? What are the influencers that are affecting you? Who are the stakeholders that you have to deal with? What are some of the challenges? And we put all of that, all of those pieces of a puzzle together to kind of get a real sense of the real problem. And we kind of narrow that into down, uh, down. We kind of hone that in to a lot of little problems that we think we can go off and resolve. Then we do what we call empathize. We try to understand the beneficiaries. Who are they? How can we help them? What do they need? Um, and we do that through a lot of social, applied social research methods like surveys and interviews. And we actually go out with something called infographic uh, uh, research, where you actually go out and live among the people, so to speak, or spend time with them, observing them or engaging with them to find out from them, from the actual source of what's going on. That's the empathize. And then we characterize that, define that. Um, and we kind of put some boundaries around that. Then we go into the synthesized process and that's where we bring all of the community, we call cross-community collaboration. We bring various stakeholders from the community with various different um, uh, points of interest um, as well as sometimes conflicting interests. And we bring them in the room and we take them through a series of processes and steps and methods and discussions. And a lot of things that we do to kind of come up with a solution um, to that problem. In some cases, we come up with multiple solutions and we prioritize, but we come up with how can we solve the problem that's most beneficial to most stakeholders in the community. We go through that, we analyze it by doing some type of prototype, some type of pilot, we get some funding from somebody to, to try it in one of the locations, we operationalize it, get it up and running, um, and then we try to institutionalize it by replicating it in other communities and making it available. That's what we do. That is the service that we offer to all of our communities. That's what we do in a nutshell, okay? Now, we've established four goals, I mean, so, I'm sorry, four programs that we're working with um, to start out, the, start out the year. So some of these programs are planned um, and, some, and one of them is actually uh, initiated. And I'll try to go through these, these real quick. So our first program is what we call Future Social Innovators. Um, that's focused to um, eighth graders through uh, freshmen or undergraduates, uh, where we develop curriculums that we want to make available for teachers with learning materials and, and things of nature where the students can do project-based learning using um, the social innovation approach to go out and solve any one of these 17 problems. And we wanna make that available to them so that they can use that in their communities. Um, or in their classrooms so the teachers can have it. So we want to give them all of the curriculum and all of the training materials that they need, uh, as well as we want to make for our own members uh, use that same stuff and we want to make it better uh, for the members um, so that they can also get trained. So we kind of upscale it a bit for our members. The other thing we do is something called social innovator incubators. 
The social innovator incubate social innovation incubators are really targeted towards the uh, the 18 to 35 year olds that have, are ambitious and have great ideas for how to solve social problems. They may be starting their own nonprofit, or they just may have a great idea or a great solution that they want to to uh, get out there and, and and help solve some of the problems in the world. That's where we bring in advisors and we help them raise funds and we kind of guide them through a process and we kind of mentor them for either six months or a year, depending on how much money we raise. We mentor them for, uh, for a period of time to get them to the point where they can launch their idea or pitch their idea for additional funding or for grants or things like that. And so we worked with them through that entire process. Uh, the third thing that we do is something called social issue resolution community projects. And this is the kind of stuff where this is where we deploy our members out into the community uh, when needed. We do this through what we call a third party uh, trusted advisors or trusted gatekeepers. So these are the uh, nonprofits and the, the faith based organizations and fraternities and sororities or whoever it is that's out there on the front lines, boots on the ground, talking to the people who need it the most. And we work with them and through them to help them solve a complex problem that they just don't have time. It's just, they're too busy feeding people or, or providing food or, or providing housing and, and, and shelter. And they just don't have time to go out and figure out, do this big thinking and figure out how to solve this problem and get to the root cause. That's kind of where we come in and that's where we will work with them. We'll talk to the stakeholders in the communities, the politicians, the other leaders in the communities, and we'll try to figure out a way we'll have a couple of sessions and we'll work through this and we'll come up with a solution and implement it. And we just take them through that entire process and that's what our members are, are doing for the community. Um, the way we do this, it is free to them. And the way we make this free is that's where our donations and our grants and all that stuff comes from. Uh, that's what it's going to be used for to make sure that we can provide those services to uh, those communities at no charge to them. Um, and we'll, that money usually will go to stipends for the, uh, for the research, um, for, the, uh, for the project leads and for any students that are going to be working on this, various uh, internships and things of that nature. And that's how we use the money and cover expenses and things of that nature. The last thing we do is something called social innovation councils. These are our public forums. Um, this is where we invite the entire community to come in. Um, and we're doing that now with education. We just had one last month. We have another one coming up on uh, February the 17th. Um, and we're looking at how to design the education system of the future. Um, education would became a real topic of discussion when we realized that it's the education system that we're living with now is that was established in the first industrial revolution, which is in the 1800s with Carnegie and and all of those big, those big dollar guys back then. So we do this by basically opening up a form and we have the public come to uh, and share their ideas. Um, we do a lot of the sharing through chat and other, way, other things like I don't ask you guys to do, but we share, they share their ideas um, through that public forum. We collect those ideas, we codify those ideas, put them in some type of writing document. We make that available to the general public but then we take those ideas and we take it to the next step and try to implement them somehow with some type of funding or uh, some type of trial project, pilot project, things of that nature to actually see if it's gonna work and what the actual impact is gonna be. <clears throat> and then we go for uh, bigger dollars. Once we can prove that we do the test one to see that it actually works, we'll then pursue grant grantors uh, to see if we can get bigger funding to scale it or partners with corporations and things of that nature to see if we can scale it and use it uh, broader in the community as well. So those are the three programs that, that we have. So keep in mind, we just have three programs, um, four programs, and the only one that we have active right now is the Social Innovation Council, and that's with our education system for the future. And I'm gonna go real quick to these last two. Um, so here's where we are on our Social Innovation Council, the education system for the future. Um, as you can see here, all of these webinar series are already scheduled, they're planned. We're getting a panelist for, by the way, if you know anybody who's an expert in any of these fields, Please, uh, by any chance, just let us know and we'll reach out to them. So we're looking for people to be on the panels. Um, the, the, the more popular the panel is, we've learned that the bigger the audience is and the audience is what we're really looking for because they're the ones that are providing the ideas and the perspectives and kind of what we call open innovation. Um, and then we're gonna have a public workshop with parents and guardians to kind of develop a journey map with them and kind of figure out what is needed for the food from the learner's perspective. Um, and we'll do that learning workshop um, as well. 
Um, and then we kind of close out uh, near the end of the year with another uh, three themes here. We do one, um, characterizing the learners, what we call personas of the learners. Um, and then we kind of establish some uh, sub, uh, learner scenarios. And then we have a big shindig where we will have uh, as many people as we can come to an invitation, a workshop where we do some ideal generation for the solutions. We'll come again, codify those solutions, uh, write those solutions up and share them and make them open to the public. Because this is a public forum, all of the information that we gather is available to the public in, in, as well. Um, out of that, and you say, you say, okay, that's great. What does all of that do? Well, out of that will come a lot of ideas for projects to go to two funding for. So when we go to uh, grant, grantors or uh, philanthropists, we can tell them, hey, the community has gotten around us on this. They, these are their ideas. They're supporting it. We have tried it. We've done a trial on it. It's workable. We need more funding to scale it. And that's where the funders come in. Okay? So I'm going to pause there. And I'm going to come. I want to talk a little bit now about how uh, you can help and how you can how you can get involved, and we're kind of going to go into that. Okay, so the way uh, we're looking for uh, people to to get involved is one through volunteering, um, and I'll talk more about that. Um, joining us, which is basically becoming a member, and I'll talk about what that means. And then also uh, donate uh, with us as well. And I'll talk about, uh, I'll go into a bit more about how the donations are, are going to be used uh, for, for, our, for our mission. So uh, if you want to volunteer, there are a lot of ways you can help us with volunteer. A lot of the volunteers uh, we, we use are helping us run the organization, so to speak. They're helping us with uh, with the with managing the operations and infrastructure and things of that nature. So we have our, our our board. We have a board of directors and we have a uh, a advisory board. So right now we have five positions on the uh, board. Right now we have we have five on the board. I think we have two positions open um, that we're still working to fill. Um, and uh, we're we're taking our nominations and candidates for that. Um, we also have, uh, we want to have committees and the committees of the governor, let me go back, the board of directors is primarily responsible for helping us with governance policies and procedures. Uh, that's what they're pretty much work helping us with and compliance with those policies and procedures. Um, and so they're really big on making sure that we do the right things and we stay within the law and that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing that we do are the committees. The committees a more strategic and more decision-making kind of organizations or help or, or uh, analyzing and coming up with recommendations for the board to, to, to decide on. So they're doing a lot of the analysis uh, and things like the fundraising committee, we have the finance committee, um, executive board, executive committee is, is a little different. And then we have a membership committee uh, on what we're looking to build. Now we haven't started those yet because we haven't had enough volunteers to, to support those yet, but those are things we need to kind of push out of the uh, of board of directors and into another body to help with those. Uh, we have working groups. A lot of our working groups are the groups that help develop uh, our products and our services. So they'll do things like help with our social media. They will help with any of the publications that we do, help sponsor and put on events. Um, so a lot of the uh, products and the services um, they help us develop those and launch those out to the broader community. Um, and then the innovation councils I talked about too. Um, so right now we have one, we can have this, we can have up to 17, um, but that generally requires somebody raising their hand and say, I want to lead one, lead one on this particular area because I have an interest in this area. Um, and then we'll make uh, resources available to help support that um, when they go out to do their community forums and things of that nature to collect the data generate their, their report. Um, use the only thing for the Innovation Council, we usually just ask if there's some type of annual report um, that comes out of those uh, that we share with the broader public. So that's one way you can get involved. Um, so if you have skills like any of these we talked about, 
Um, and you want to do that, please uh, let us know or any of our directors um, or advisors. Please know. Joining us, the other thing we do is that we have members. Now our members, um, they're primarily responsible for doing that social innovation process that I talked about at the beginning. Um, so they're the ones that are actually gonna go out and help implement some of these programs and actually help implement some of these so, uh, social innovation um, activities that we do for the community. Um, so they will do those for the community. Um, and if we get uh, those uh, projects where we get a government contract to do something, I don't know, uh, we could get a government contract to go do a survey on the street. So we might bring some uh, college kids or high school kids out with talents to go out there and, and do those surveys. Um, those type of contracts, um, they will go with our members. Um, and if there's funding to go along with that, uh, we will, there will be stipends to uh, our members to, to support those activities. Um, and then uh, we also try to raise the money to cover any expenses that they may have um, as well uh, and supplies that they may need. So that's kind of what the, what some of the funding will go to with some of these projects. We do that so that we can make them free to the community. Um, and many of these people, they do have uh, companies or businesses that are aligned to what they do, uh, but for a small uh, stipend, a lot less than what they would normally charge, they volunteer or take off a day or two or even a weekend. Um, to go out and do this. But the benefit to the members is that they, one, get to be in a body of people with shared ideas and a common goal. And two, um, we provide them that training uh, to become qualified and eventually certified um, to be a part of our, our team that we deploy um, to, to the various uh, regions. What we want to do is get as many people as possible so that we don't have to do a lot of travel. So people don't have to go from the East Coast to the West Coast. So one of the things we're looking at doing um, in the future um, going forward is having affiliates or kind of chapters um, that we can start establishing uh, where some of the social innovators can be local and deal with regional issues and regional challenges um, in their communities as well. Uh, but for right now, um, we're, we're just located here and we are trying to train people in various parts of the country. Anybody in the United States, uh, its territories or um, or the uh, tribal nations um, are by all means um, are the type of people that we're trying to help with this. So we have a student level, um, roughly about $35 a year. Um, and it could be, like I said, eighth grade to uh, college. A lot, they only have to be fully enrolled professional, anybody under 65 and not in school. Uh, and then we have an emeritus for anybody that's over 65 years old. Uh, but, and that's just to kind of help balance the, the cost of the membership um, based off of uh, people's economic needs. Um, and that's kind of what our membership will do. Um, and then the other way you can help is you can donate. So with our donation program, <clears throat> the ways you can support us uh, financially is that one, you can attend our fundraising events uh, and contribute that way. Um, and we're going to be trying to do some of those. It's a little harder to do that in a virtual environment, but there are ways to do that. And we're going to try to do one this year, and it will probably be, be virtual. The other thing is our patron program. If you want to donate uh, a one-time gift, or if you want to make a monthly recurring gift, uh, we have a process set up for that. It's on our website, uh, www.thesiaa.org, www dot -E org, um, and that's that's where you can go and then there's a little button there you can hit donate and then you can go in there and donate uh, online. Um, the other thing is um, uh, that if your company does matching, so there are a couple of matching opportunities. So there's workplace matching and then there are other tools like uh, uh, Amazon has a matching program as well. Um, so you can buy a product and you can have uh, uh, Amazon um, donate to our organization as well. So there are those type of opportunities. And we'll, we'll... Yeah, that's under the Amazon Smiles. Yes, thank you. The Amazon Smiles. Um, so that's another way that you can donate with us as well. Uh, and then major gifts, uh, those are people, uh, generally major gifts are people who give more than 10% of their income. Um, they give a big, the major donors, um, or they give big dollars. They, they have a lot of money, maybe 1% of a you know, trillionaire. It's pretty good. I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, 
But um, those are those are people that that have a lot of money that they're willing to donate, or large family foundations, or large uh, large grant making organizations. And um, if you know those, if you have relationships with them, if you know people who make those type of donations, and you want to make introductions to either me or any of our board members, by all means, please do so, um, and we will reach out to them as well. Um, and probably give them some type of discussion like this and materials and, and or one on one conversations about what we did. So those are the ways you can donate. You can also stay involved with us uh, in a lot of ways. Um, one, uh, we have uh, you can donate with us online. Give reminders. You can donate uh, through checks. Uh, there's our mailing address. Um, and then a lot of this stuff is already on our website, by the way. Um, so if you want to go to our website, um, if you want to learn more about us, uh, you can get involved with us on emails. Um, and then you can also call us. So this is pretty much all of our contact uh, information and ways to get in touch with us and stay engaged with us um, if you want to. The easiest way is uh, the website. Um, so a lot of this stuff is on the website. So if you go to that, it's easy to find. Uh, so, here's what we kind of discussed. Uh, we talked about the challenge. Why are we doing this? Why is this really important to us? Um, and that is because of all of the challenges and so, the complex social problems that we're dealing with. Um, and there's a lot of people hurting. There are a lot of people out there hurting who need the help. Um, and we want to make sure that they can help themselves by our facilitation and our guidance. Um, one of the things that we will all recognize and we will all notice at this time is that we can no longer depend on our elected officials, officials to solve our problems. Uh, they just, either for whatever reasons, are not equipped or not capable or can agree or any of the above. And so what we're finding is that some of the best ways people are solving their problems is to solve it themselves or solve it with their communities. And that's kind of what we want to facilitate. We want to kind of generate that and rejuvenate that kind of activity um, in communities and get people working and think about how do I solve my own problems? Um, and if we need to bring in government stakeholders and officials, we want to go to them and say, hey, we figured this out. We just need you to make it a law. Just go make it a law. That's all you need to do. Uh, that's kind of where we want to go with that. Uh, we thought about the team, the fact that we have volunteers, we have uh, uh, members, um, and we have uh, 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 people that we are, are sending out to go do this work. Um, and as well as depending on the, our, our community-based organizations and our, our public uh, forums as well. Um, we talked about our process and the services that go along with it. Those services generally, generally include applied uh, social research. It includes uh, um, innovation management uh, implementation, uh, as well as um, uh, designing uh, idea solution and, and things of that nature. So that's kind of what we do as an organization. Those are the services that we provide our communities. Uh, we do that. We can also do it on a fee for service basis for uh, government organizations, state, federal, local, as well as for corporations as well. So we can do it on a fee for service basis for them as well. But we want to be raising the money to do it for communities at no charge to those communities, uh, either through sponsorships or through donations. And then we're also looking for your help. And so there are a lot of ways that we talk about to get involved, um, depending on what your comfort level is, what you feel are the best ways to get involved, uh, and how you'd like to participate. Um, we are very active on social media. Um, so here are all of our social, social media platforms. Um, I welcome you to engage on your preferred approach or your preferred social media platform. Uh, and stay uh, connected to us as well. We provide a lot of information about what we're doing, a lot of updates and things of that nature. You can also be a subscriber on our website. I think I have that on here somewhere. Yes, uh, the globe there is the website. Um, and with that, you can also get to all of these other uh, links. If you can't remember anything else, you can at least go to the website and find out where all of our social media links are and get to those things. So that's what we do. That's what we do as an organization. Um, we're kind of running uh, times where we're not going to do the brainstorming session that I was going to go through, but I do want to kind of open it up to questions. Um, but what we really want to try to do is let uh, the communities, uh, we want to guide communities to, to solve their own problems. I mean, we want to deploy as many uh, social innovators as we can. My goal 
is by uh, in, in five years, or 2025, is to have 2,500 uh, certified or qualified social innovators available around the country to support local communities uh, for free, free, free to those communities um, to be there. And with that, I will now open it up to questions. So I can get all stuff to it. So John, we had a question come up in our breakout session regarding our current status on funding. And mm -hmm. I mentioned that we had gotten the 501c3 letter and that we were registering in states um, so that it would be tax deductible, but we would be starting you know, a bigger funding side through memberships and trying to get grants. So if you wanna address that a little bit, that would be helpful. Yes, so yeah, so our, our we, at the date of incorporation, anybody who's donated anything to us as of August the 1st is also retroactive, even though we only got our 501c3 in December. Um, so anybody who's donated or those people who donated through the ticket purchases for some of our events, um, that funding and that those donations are tax deductible and we can, we can take those tax deductions. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do as far as getting funding is we really want to start doing more with our fundraising um, and then we are starting to get people interested in, in, in membership as well. Um, and so that's kind of what we're trying to do. I know I look good, but y'all might ask questions. I don't know. <laughs> I don't bite. <laughs> I think there was a question for you in the chat. I sent okay. you the question. I don't have my chat open. Hold on. Okay, which one? Oh yes, breaking breakout room feedback. Yes, I do need breakout room feedback. <laughs> so can some of you guys just kind of tell me some of the things that that, that you learned in the breakout room? Who do I have? I think Blake. Maybe perhaps Blake wanted to say something? I'm sure. Um, so in our room, um, there was some feedback around the priority, t the priority of the um, issues you're going to tackle. You mentioned the United Nations 17 issues, and uh, there's just some concern about what do you want to tackle first? What is your approach and your vision towards um, that, that tackling all those um, you know, at one time? Yeah, so the, the, the tackling all of those at one time, that's really depending on um, some of our um, volunteers or members deciding they want to start a social innovation council around one of those 17. That is purely driven by who wants to step up to do it. Um, that, that's how those are being addressed. As far as what we uh, are going to address, it's basically going to depend a lot on, well, as far as our first social innovation council, that is on education. That's one that's called Design the design School for the, for the Future. Um, design the Education System for the Future. That's the one we're focused on for 2021. That's the only one I'm personally sponsoring and heading out this year. That's all I have the bandwidth to do, okay? Um, any of the others, um, if for example, one of, uh, there's a teacher at a school who wants to pick up one of these and they say, well, well, we can do a social innovation council on this one for our high school, that's fine. Then they're, they're more than welcome to do that and we will help them get set up and put it in place and that kind of stuff. So those 17 are not gonna be kind of like, they're kind of loosely managed um, they're more public forum for people to have discussions and kind of solve some of these problems. The things, the other three programs are the ones that we will probably spend most of our time uh, focusing on. And that is the, um, the social innovation incubator and the social um, innovation, uh, future social innovators for the uh, eighth through um, college and then the uh, social incubators for the 18 to 35 um, and then the community project, the community-based projects are the three things that we will spend, um, that I um, and, and most of the members will spend most of their time on. Um, but the other ones are for uh, any of the affiliates or if we ever get any, or any of the schools or any of the other organizations that want to lead that, we will help them set it up, get it running, tell them what to do. Um, and then it kind of it runs, uh, runs its pace. 
And then one more question um, was around, there's a lot of companies or there's a lot of organizations doing this kind of work, like you mentioned um, Stanford and United Nations. So what makes SIAA different in their, in their approach to handling these problems? All right, that's an excellent question. Um, so uh, Stanford is really focusing on, um, they're more of a, a, a research uh, think tank institute um, and they really just captured uh, information about what social innovation is. They write a lot of articles, they have journals, um, they're more of an academic institution um, in their approach. Um, they invite people like us who are actually doing the work um, to attend, but they're not actually uh, doing a lot of that work. They have a lot of conferences and things of that nature. Um, as far as any other organizations, if you think about think tanks, a lot of times think tanks, they, just, they, they come up with a great idea, they do the research, and they publish a paper in the discussion. They publish a paper. Um, I think what we do is we take it a step further and we say, okay, we came up with a great idea. We do more applied research. So we're looking for research that's directed to a specific problem. Uh, we find the, 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 the solutions that we're looking for. We test them out and then we actually go implement them um, and try to see if they're gonna make a social impact. And if they do, we try to scale them and replicate them um, to other communities. So we take it that extra step uh, where even, look, many, even social uh, research organizations don't do that. Again, even some of the social and humanitarian research organizations, they do a lot of the research and they publish papers. Uh, we take it beyond publishing papers. We actually wanna see results in the communities. We actually wanna see social impact. Um, and so we take it the next step, which is a hard step. And that's the real hard step. Oh, so everybody's quiet. So I mean, I expect your donations uh, right after we get off. Is somebody click and donate right now. Yes, yes, no. Any other questions? Okay, I appreciate uh, for those of you I guys who contributed. Oh, I'm sorry. I have, I have a question. I put it in the chat box, but I guess you didn't see it. Um, no, I did. I'm sorry. Is, okay, this is Dr. Joyce Keith Hargrove. So, um, how do you ensure that you have the expertise necessary to address and solve a community's problem? So. The, the big thing that we look for is uh, we start out with uh, other people who know our members knowing how to do the process, how to work through what tools and techniques they have at their disposal, how to use those tools and techniques. And then we, we kind of make sure that they are there to guide and facilitate the process. Um, a lot of the expertise will come from our members. Um, so we'll see that we need expertise in this. It will come from uh, academic institutions in that community. Um, so we'll, we'll go after acquisitions. Um, and then we also will go after the community. The stakeholders in that community um, are bringing their ideas to the table as well. We'll also look for other trailblazing um, um, social innovators in their community. So it's really about bringing the community. The our, our talent to solving these problems is really about bringing the community together, finding those stakeholders, those, those uh, uh, bright people, the people that are trusted by that community, bring them together in a room and get them to, to walk them through the process of solving that problem. And that's kind of what we do. Okay, that well, that, that... well, well, I, yeah, yes, thank you for that answer. And um, I had mentioned when we were in the chat room, one of the things that I take pride in is being able to uh, establish strategic, what I call strategic collaborations Mm -hmm. to get to, to to solve a problem to get a project done to get a program implemented so maybe that's the area um that you might be able to benefit from from that expertise so, oh so you're volunteering absolutely we will certainly, <laughs> <laughs> certainly take your expertise i'm sure so we make sure you get your name down and we will certainly be in touch with you but absolutely oh, that that's exactly what we're trying to do now, now not that's, in all areas but if it's something no, no, no. that i'm i'm knowledgeable about yes i can absolutely do that okay yeah because a big part of it is stakeholder management it gets into a lot of what we do um and it's a lot of soft skills and that's why it's not just for technical people or or, or researchers hardcore researchers there's a lot of soft skills involved involved in what we do Facilitating work sessions. That's that. I mean, uh, Michelle Back can tell you a lot about that. I mean, that's a, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of soft skills that go into that. Uh, moderating discussions, um, negotiating, uh, con resolving conflicts within that within that group. The stakeholder management and the uh, the public relations that go on 
uh, prior to the actual session that we get into. Um, once you come up with that idea of promoting and selling that idea to the community. So it takes, it takes a village to really get these things to work. So it's just not uh, one, uh, one, you can't have just one expertise. And our role is to bring, to bring the right people to the table together and walk them through that entire journey to where they get impact in their community or they get resolution or a solution to their problems in their community. Um, that's when we kind of, when this, when we operationalize it and it's up and running and it's sustaining itself, that's kind of when we say, great job. We'd like to make you kind of the lead on this and we'll send people to you so you can explain to them so they can try to replicate it in their community. Or, and, and, or, and we will have documentation of what we did with that group that's available for them as well. So we kind of make that available as part of our public service. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you are, if there's a problem in a community and there's an organization already in that community um, beginning to make some type of progress, you partner with that organization um, to advise and give guidance. Um, mm -hmm. What role do you play in funding and yeah. ensuring there's some type in order to ensure sustainability that there's sufficient funding there for the project? So if there's a, one of the things, we, we don't walk into any community uh, just unknown and say, hey, we're here to help. So we also, we always have what we call a trusted uh, gatekeeper. So that's somebody who is, whether they're a, a faith-based leader or community-based leader or a, a nonprofit leader in that community that knows that community, that knows those people. Uh, we usually come through them through invitation or we'll send them a request and say, we, we can help you if you would like our services. Um, and that's how we get into the community. But yeah, uh, and we don't, yeah, so we don't go into, I just want to do want to make that clear because we don't just, um, go knock on your door or go knock on somebody's, uh, some nonprofit door and say, we want to come solve your problem. Um, it's usually through them understanding what we do um, and inviting us in to do that with their community. As far as the funding is concerned, the way the funding is addressed is that um, uh, the fundings that we raise are, are to support the people that we, we put out there. Like I said, there's usually an internship stipend for the college students that are supporting it. Uh, there may be a smaller stipend for the person who's going out into the community to facilitate the process. Once we, that, that's what our funding primarily costs is, and any expenses and supplies that goes along with that. Once that community decides that this project we like, um, then we start looking at for, for larger donors to work with that nonprofit. So we will work with them and uh, trying to get them grants. We will try to make introductions if we can. Um, but we would try to make sure they get the fund. We will find a corporate sponsorships um, to actually implement that project. Um, and we'll work with them through, through those means um, to try to get the money to go ahead and implement that, um, that project. Um, and that's, 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 that's how we do it. We don't, we're not a funding agency. Uh, and we don't want to be because there's a whole another set of tax laws and nonprofit regulations that go along with that. Mm -hmm. So we are not a funding agency. Um, um, I, I know I think I talked to you about that idea, but I kind of nipped that idea in the bud once I realized all the legal ramifications associated with being a funding organization. So we, we fund the people that support you, um, but when it comes to actually funding the project, we try to do that through corporate uh, partnerships and through other grant, granting organizations. So you fund the people that support us, and then there is, is there a fee to that Nonprofit organization. It's, that's that's what we raise the funds for. So the donations that we raise um, is so that it's free to the community-based organizations okay. or to the communities. So it's no charge to anybody in that community uh, for whatever services we do. Uh, and I didn't go a lot into some of the things that go along with that. There's a lot more that goes to it than, than I had time to share with you here. Uh, but the community gets a lot out of the work that that this team that this team will be able to do uh, when we go forward. Uh, but yeah, the money that the money to actually implement it will come through corporate partnerships and granting organizations, and in, in your own fundraising. If you're the if you're the, if you're the host community, uh, the host organization. So usually we'll work with the host organization. If you're the host organization and it's your idea, and you're going to implement the idea with us or for us, I should say for us with us or for yourself, uh, then uh, then we'll help you raise that money and that kind of stuff. 
Uh, John, it might be helpful when we had our board meeting the other day, you were giving the example um, that a nonprofit may be trying to feed people right then and more of an urgent need versus the kind mm -hmm. of issue that we would take on and walk through that example. That could be helpful. More of a thing. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so one of the things a lot of people uh, there are a lot of a lot of nonprofits that are doing things what I call those recurring issues. They're constantly solving those recurring issues, feeding the homeless, providing shelter. Those are things that are needed. They're very valuable. They're very important. Uh, and nobody wants to say, "Oh, let me go do research for four months, come back with a solution while you starve to death." That's not that's not the kind of nonprofit we are. So those organizations, those are what we call our, our trusted gatekeepers, or our hosts, um, uh, organizations. They can be faith-based, they can be social and fraternal organizations, they can be community-based organizations, and in some cases, they can be government organizations as well. Um, the, the government organizations, we usually will try to uh, get some funding from them um, to do this, but for the others, we will try to do, we will try to do it for free to them, the service is free to them. Um, and so what we will go in and do, so if they're feeding the hungry, We'll say, well, what are some of the root causes of this? Oh, well, we just had uh, we just had a uh, a fire in this neighborhood, and so now there's a spike in that. Okay, well, what can we go do to solve that problem? And what's causing that problem? And we kind of go down this root cause and try to work with the community. Now, we can't come up with a solution on our own because it's a very complex solution. As you can imagine, there's so many stakeholders, there's so many tentacles involved in this. So then we say, well, who are the stakeholders we need to bring to the table? Which agencies in your community, what organizations, what people, what, who are some of the, the change agents, who are some of the champions um, that we can bring together to the table? Uh, we'll, try to, we'll try to recruit them or, or go out to them and do one-on-one -on -one stakeholder engagement to get them involved and to get buy-in. Um, and then we get them to a point where we can bring them to the table, to the room, and go through what we call our, our, our techniques and our methods to kind of work through how we come up with a solution. It's mutually agreeable to most uh, all, if not all of the people that are involved, so all of the stakeholders. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, I am available uh, via, I am, like I said, I'm on social media. My wife fusses me all the time because I'm on social media too late because I do a lot of my marketing and, and communications through social media. So I am there. Feel free to reach out to me, uh, to contact me there. Uh, get, up, get in touch with me any way you need to if you have further questions. If you got a chance to meet any of our board of directors or advisors and you want to reach out to them, by all means, please do so or contact them as well. Um, I think most, if not all of them, are on social media as well. Um, so you can reach out to them that way. And if they want to exchange their emails, that's fine too. So I, I really do appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day. And uh, for those of you who, uh, who like your new shows, I'm sorry you missed half of it. I do hope you put it on record. Um, and I will uh, see all of you again later. There are no other questions.